So thank you for coming to this next session. I mean, I, I'm very aware, sorry, for those of you who weren't at the opening session, I'm Jude Kelly, I'm one of the co-founders of the festival. And, um, you know, we, we have a lot in common in all kinds of ways. Uh, and we also have things that separate us. And those things are experiences, lived experiences, um, and different relationships to power. Um, but one of the things that we can maybe agree on is that the support for the epidemic of violence that people suffer, and particularly women and non-binary people suffer, the epidemic, we can kind of be absolutely sure that it is not being provided in terms of help in the, in, in a, in the right way, in a strategic way, in a policy-directed way that is allowing for everyone to be secure. That's just not the case. Uh, and if you were in the previous session about the normalization of sexual violence, you'll have heard some of the, the dreadful statistics. Well, you know, one example that Laura Bates just gave was that the donkey sac a donkey sanctuary in Devon gets three times the amount of funding of all the rape, cri rape crisis centers in the UK. Um, that's a pretty alarming statistics. I'm glad for the donkeys, obviously. Um, but it is a terrifying statistic and speaks of something to do with, you know, what we value. We've got four amazing people here who are all dealing with frontline services. And so i just like them to introduce themselves to you um, one by one. So, Rose, over to you. See, nearly afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Hey. Hi, my name is Rosa Lewis. I am from Sister Space. We are a grassroots charity uh, domestic abuse team uh, working with um, African and Caribbean heritage women and girls. And um, yeah, I'll leave it like that for now. Got lots to say, by the way. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Rabia Majid Aris. Um, I'm a researcher at St. Mary's Sexual Assault Referral Centre in Manchester, which is um, NHS and police funded organisation providing like forensic medical care, is for care and counselling care to people um, that have reported sexual violence. Uh, good afternoon, my name's Dr. Kath White. I'm the clinical director of St. Mary's SARC, Sexual Assault Referral Centre in Manchester. I'm also the sexual offence medicine lead for the Faculty of Forensic and Legal Medicine. And then um, I do a little bit of UN work, mainly in the Middle East, um, regarding sexual violence. Hi, I'm Radul Vadva. I am, I hate this title, I must say, but I'm the CEO of Edinburgh Rape Crisis Centre um, up in Scotland, and uh, we provide um, support services for survivors of sexual violence in Edinburgh and some surrounding uh, local areas as well. Okay, so you would think that now that the Evening Standard and major papers and major media outlets are speaking for the first time in my lifetime daily about the statistics around domestic violence, sexual violence, violence generally, uh, as, a, as, a, as a, a weapon of power against women and non-binary people, you would expect that, therefore, what would be matched by that mainstream of conversation would be services uh, and, uh, and, and opportunities for people to be protected and supported, etc. Uh, it being so mainstreamed, suddenly, you'd think, well, on the other side of it, there must be uh, something that's happening. I think that's probably not the case. And Rose, I'm going to start with you. Can you talk about you know, what you feel about frontline services, what you're trying to provide, and, and, and what is actually happening in terms of funding and support? And, and you've been at this quite a long time. So you know, what's the historical sense as well of whether it's been getting better or getting worse? Grassroots organizations are essential to the whole mix of domestic abuse. We do the work that all the other organizations who get funded, have the money, do the, the surveys and all kinds of things where they can, they can never reach. 
we do the work where women will never get the chance to speak to these people who are in power and make decisions. And that is really sad. We at Sister Space ensure that we at least get, um, if, it's a, if it's just the police, uh, the, um, well, in Hackney, it's not the mayor anymore because of our relationship with him, but councillors and people of positions and people who make policies, we ensure that survivors get to speak to them so they can hear the survivors' voices. This may well happen, but I'll tell you, when it comes to black women, this very rarely happens. So we have made sure, and we will continue to make sure, that women's, black women's voices are heard. Oftentimes people will say, well, what's the difference if something happens to, if, if as an example, if a black woman uh, gets raped or assaulted, why do you think that it's different? But there is a lot of difference. And the first thing where the difference is, and that includes even with the whole thing of organizations, it's racism. So we're not gonna pretend. The second thing, the second thing is, a lot of people are not used to hearing black women speak and tell our truth, how it is, grassroots, no hold bars and actually maybe attribute, I'm gonna call it blame, attribute blame, and also bring up uh, solutions to those issues. Oftentimes, it's other people that are speaking for us, and it's across the board. It's white people, it's, um, it's the BAME community, which we cannot tolerate, cannot stand that term, because that term just lumps everybody together. And I know I may be uh, speaking to the converted, but it lumps everything, everybody together, and um, it discriminates. As we say, it puts white people over here, and it puts everybody else over here. And just including that little bit about funding, the, the, the BAME, quote unquote, community that's there, have to fight for that little piece of funding that comes through, when and if it comes through. And even with the funding, there's so much um, rules and regulations and you know, all kinds of things. And most often, grassroots organizations do not have the criterias to get the money for funding to help, uh, to help the women uh, to get equal services that uh, they should be entitled to. One example I have to give, like my mother's age group, came here, some of them long before, because a lot of people know about the wind rush, but there were lots of different boats and ships that came through. My mother's age group never got to use domestic abuse services in this country, but yet they worked, paid their taxes, and contributed, as you know, to this country, um, like big time. Uh, we Sister Space, we started off um, after the really horrific um, death of Valerie Ford and her baby RJ, real Jazeera, in Hackney. And um, after the whole case and everything happened, we found that there was nowhere for black women to go. We didn't even have a domestic abuse service for ourselves. All the other services, you know, they helped and everything, but unless you are from that community, as you all know, you can't really speak for us. You really don't really know, really, really know about us. And so this is how we started. So we support African heritage women and girls unapologetically, because there's often times where we spend a lot of time having to prove why we need to exist. And that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of energy. You did ask me one more thing. Well, I'm asking now whether, you know, you, you give that story, which is a fantastic example of something where you look around and you say, this, this, this should be here and it's not, so we'll begin it, right? The need is so obvious, you'd think, okay, well, like uh, accidents and emergency services, we'll have one in every single hospital, in every single place, yeah. all over the country. Has that happened? Has that sprung up all over the country? Having a, you've, you've pointed to the need. 
what's the result of you pointing to the need? We are one of, as far as we know, the only African heritage um, service just for black women. There in the whole are, country, there in the are, whole country, Rose? In the whole country? In, in the whole country. There are, when, uh, there are other services, black services, but strictly for black women, we're the only ones. Um, it's, been, it's been very hard, very long. Funding, uh, you know, we're doing fine now, but that's because we had to continuously be in everybody's faces. Um, the testimony as to why we're here, one, because of the women passing the message on, and two, because of the support that we have from the whole, a whole wide range of communities. Um, part of it was in our local borough of Hackney, we actually had a huge battle with our local, with our local council about safe spaces for black women. And we had to have a protest. It was dirty, it was nasty. Um, it still continues now. We're not funded by our own borough. Hackney has a, a high percentage of black people there, black women. They have a few, uh, you know, services, a lot of domestic abuse services. So it's, it's things like that, not having support from your local council where you live and where you work. And um, not, to date, not being supported by it. But despite that, you just, you just keep going on. And you raise awareness, you keep talking about it, you keep challenging those who are in positions to do it, and this is why we are where we are here today. Okay, thank you. You know, when we think about the scale of what we're talking about, and then you hear that that is the only service, and then you realize that this is a service which is only there because you and your sisters are kind of struggling away, making life difficult for people, being a thorn in the flesh, you know, shouting and everything. We are normalizing that as well. We're allowing that to happen. You know, when people say, well, what are we going to do about GPs or doctors or dentists? And what are we going to do about this? Midgel, can I come to you? Because obviously the, the Edinburgh Centre is, you know, very important, vital. But my impression, again, is that this is just too few, too, too spread out. I mean, wh where do you feel as if services are now in relationship to need? So I can speak for Scotland, and I, I would say that the funding uh, situation in Scotland has improved significantly during the pandemic. And also, I would say, like, if there was a single event that that maybe changed the, gov the Scottish government's relationship with rape crisis centres, which was improving, and they had made commitments uh, and, and increased our funding, but we were historically underfunded, even when we compared ourselves to domestic abuse services in Scotland, uh, was the Alex Salmon trial. And we saw... The Alex Salmon trial, yes, ah, okay. Uh, who was the former First Minister of Scotland. And we saw um, soon after that, the the current First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, who is a committed feminist. And I think, um, you know, despite her being a politician, uh, she is, at least on a per individual level, quite a committed feminist, and that makes such a huge difference. And she met, before my time, but she met with survivors uh, at Edinburgh Rape Crisis. And we saw, soon after the recent Scottish election, a real infusion of further funds into our services to tackle our, our waiting lists. However, saying all of that, we are still playing catch up. Um, Edinburgh Rape Crisis Centre, like many rape crisis centres in Scotland, uh, have really long waiting lists. Uh, we had closed our waiting list for the entire pandemic, so it was close to all referrals because women were waiting for about 15 months to be seen by one of our our support staff, unless uh, you had contacted us and had experienced rape or sexual assault in the last seven days, we were not able to see you. Um, it's only recently opened up, uh, but we had to redesign our service to something, f in my view, which is flawed, but has allowed us to see women sooner, soon after referral. Um, 
but they're still waiting six to nine months to get, what, 16 sessions of support. This is not how rape crisis centers should work. But also which women are using our services. Um, it's mostly white, middle class, able-bodied women who are using rape crisis services. It is much more harder uh, and, and for us uh, to, and there are many ways of saying this, but we are not seeing brown, black, disabled women use our services um, in the way that they should. So we are still a very white service. And if your energy is consumed with raising money uh, and the people who are supposed to go out into the community, and if you are a, like, you know, I am a brown migrant trans woman who leads the center, but I've only been there for six months, but this is a, a very white organization. So if you're spending all your energy in, in surviving as an organization, you then neglect those who need your services the most, who are furthest away from justice, from healing, and those are people who are marginalized, and that's the reality. So we have seen more money come in, uh, and I think for the next two years, uh, my center, like many rape crisis centers in Scotland, are in a place where we might be able to breathe, where we might see a reduction in the time that people are waiting or not waiting, depending on your geography. Uh, so it might allow us to work with those who, know, who don't really use our services in the way that they should. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so as fate would have it, yes. or whatever, you happen to live in a part of the country, or a country, mm -hmm. where there is a first minister who happens to be a feminist, hooray, and because of a huge scandal in her own political party, she's given you a dollop of money. That's a bit yes. happen chance, isn't it? I yes. Mean, if you were to look at, like, how is a nation going to fund this need as a whole? What would you say needed to happen? Well, I, I think it, we just have to accept and acknowledge that sexual violence exists and that we need money to heal from it. It affects more than 50% of our population um, every day. And why should we have to spend our time arguing for, for as, as Laura said in the previous session, why should we have to waste our energy arguing for something that we know is needed and has been needed? Edinburgh Rape Crisis has been around since 1978. It's as old as I am. Uh, and I used to work in a, uh, and in Scotland, there is some advantage to calling ourselves black minority ethnic because we are so small as ethnic minorities. Uh, and I worked in a, a BME women's organization for a really long time. Uh, we started like 10 years after all the other women's aids and rape crisis centers uh, in Scotland. Um, and we, we demonstrate every year hundreds of women going through our services. The case is made you just have to give us the money. And I can tell you today how much money I need so that there's no waiting list. How much? Just over two and a half million pounds a year. For it's not a lot. Okay, so two and a half million pounds a year for your center? Yes. Okay, and so how many centers do you think we need across the whole country? So, um, well, Rape Crisis Scotland, which is the, the, the membership body for rape crisis centers, uh, we have 17 that cover the whole geography of Scotland. And I think that should do but we just need more money and more capacity and a recognition that this is a problem that's not going away anytime soon. Okay, so I, I mean, I would say there is an unvirtuous circle, whereas if you give a, lot of, if you give a little amount, you're suggesting that the problem is little and that it's just for some women in some places that, you know, for whatever reason, you know, have these situations. So there's a massive discrepancy, isn't there, between what we know to be the statistics and the kind of normalization that actually it doesn't really happen very much, which is sort of so, such a weird thing. And I was, so I was going to come to you because, I mean, in a way, you know, you, when you speak of what you're doing, you think someone like me goes, fantastic, this is great. This is like a recognition of the need and also the need for the research and the need for the policy development. Do you feel as if we are changing the nature of how seriously this is all being taken and that, that we're on the verge of change in terms of services? Um, no. <laughs> Sorry, that uh, to burst the bubble there. Um, I, I think that it's a case of divide and conquer. So, you know, the, we're given 
um, as a, a group some funding, but then we're scrapping between each other for, for the funding, uh, which is distracting from the fact that actually the overall amount of money that we're given is not enough. But it's not just about money, it's about the level of seriousness that this is given. So, say so in my world, the SARC world, which I know everybody... Can you think, say what SARC is? SARC, the Sexual Assault Referral Centres, which um, we, you know, have had a reputation that, that we're rolling in money and we're not, and our waiting lists are long. But um, what I see across the, uh, say, England and Wales, is that there has been a, a bit of a race to the bottom in terms of the staffing of SARCs, um, private providers, and I'm not saying private providers have to be bad, um, but where there is a move to have um, low-trained um, forensic staff who have hardly any forensic training, why is that? Why can't we elevate? Why can't we see that actually, I know the forensic medical is just one part, and not even everybody gets that part, but why can't we elevate that to the importance that it should be given and recognize um, that we need to have forensic medicine as a, a speciality? I mean, after Sarah Everard, the amount of money that the government promised, I think it equated to something like one pound per woman across the UK. Um, so it, it, it's peanuts um, that they want to um, give to us. And I think, you know, we're talking about waiting lists, but that's just the people that are coming forward. And we need to be doing a lot more work on who isn't coming forward. As you mentioned, a lot will, will never touch the, the inside of a SARC. Uh, and I know Rabia and I, we spend a lot of time looking at who doesn't come to the SARC and trying to reach out to them. But a lot more work could be done regarding that. But, I mean, to get more people to come to the SARC, you need publicity. And you need all kinds of ways of going out into the community, you know, not just sort of posters, but, you know, people going to visitor centres, going to, uh, you know, childminders, all, all kinds of stuff. And there isn't presumably the resource to do that at the moment. We don't have... The, I mean, we, do, we try and we have community mor mornings and it's a constant... You know, we reach out to all the frontline staff uh, so that they know about SARC. So if they had somebody, say, presenting acutely... Um, that the midwife, the A&E doctor, the GP, the nurse practitioner would know to refer in. And a lot of our referrals come through the police as well um, for the forensic medical. But in terms of, because we have the ISVA service, the independent sexual violence advisors, we have the counsellors, um, where people don't have to come through the police. But you're right, uh, there isn't, we don't have that budget to go out. And then you you've got to have the capacity to meet the demand when you have gone out there. I mean, we um, have seen a real surge in referrals. I think it was Wednesday this week. We had 12 acute uh, rape cases needing a forensic medical examination. Uh, and that's not just this week. You know, that's day by day. And when you think each forensic medical examination would take, say, three and a half hours, four hours, and you've got one doctor available... The maths, you could, you, very rapidly, it doesn't add up. Um, so we need to increase the capacity. But we spend so much energy um, sort of pleading with commissioners when that shouldn't be the case. Our, our minds should be free to be creative. How is it we can best help these people? And the funding, just showing those numbers, the funding should follow through. And I think it's um, a sign that we aren't treated women, not just women, but victims of sexual violence and domestic violence are not given the status that we should be given. Okay, so Ravi, the, the, what's just been said about, you know, the, 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 the need is huge the resources are, are tiny, and there's a, a kind of an attitude about resources as well, which is, well, you know, we can give you a little bit more maybe. Mm -hmm. um, in your time working in this sector, 
Have you seen anything that looks like it can change the dial? What, what do you think that we as society can do? Because I'm wondering whether we normalize it. That's my thing, that like, we accept the situation because we've been told that that's our lot in a way. Yeah, well, I think in my time in the area, so I've been working at St. Mary's for about six years, and I think a key thing Thing to kind of change societal attitude and change wider attitude is having the evidence base there. Um, so there's lots of, and I, th I think touching on what the speakers have already mentioned, there's a lot of issues around intersectionalities that exist um, and that might make it more challenging for services to appropriately support and make their service more accessible. Um, so I think one of the things at St. Mary's, we've been really fortunate to have this researcher position, but this is really unusual in the country. I think societally there's something that probably is acknowledged, but probably more at a policy level. It should be something that should be seen more routinely. So when we've done, there's various projects we've done. So we've looked at, we've done a project specifically on people with learning disabilities. And since we're kind of, so the, the main thing that we looked at was the prevalence of people with learning disabilities that were using the service. And it's really high, it's about one in 12 people that come to the service has a learning disability. And when you compare that to the general population, it's one in 50. But in terms of how we're um, commissioned, there wasn't, a diff there wasn't an acknowledgement of that need. And it's only by having that evidence base that slowly we've been able to make the case for having a specific um, is for an ind independent sexual violence advisor who can support people with learning disabilities who's got the skills to do that. So, um, and there's lots of projects like that. So often it is like the marginalized groups. So if we look at the moment, we're just doing a project looking at sex workers, we've just got the ethics for that. Ourselves and lots of SARCs around the country have identified that sex workers aren't attending services as much as you'd expect them to, that like these are a vulnerable group. But to do that work, to identify what are the barriers to them attending, that's kind of it's quite rich qualitative research that you need to do. You need to cons and when you're looking at more vulnerable groups or you're looking at groups that might not have English as a first language, as soon as you start looking at marginalized groups, things become more expensive. Um, and so it's quite not unusual to kind of just focus on the majority population because we, you know, just like in services, research is also very, you know, we're doing things on a shoestring. So, um, yeah, to answer your question, I think it is a little bit on a societal level, but I think it can kind of be led by, by policy and by commissioners and by practice. And do you see any shift happening? I mean, these conversations have become prevalent, perhaps that's too strong a way to put it, but, you know, it, we're certainly talking about it in society now. Mm -hmm. And so do you feel as if all around the country there are other research spaces springing up to, 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 to be bringing all the data together? So probably in the last five years, we ha I have seen that there's more and more kind of networks in this area. So there's the Violence Against Women and Girls Network, which I'm part of. There's the Violence and Mental Health Network, which are kind of... I and there's been a domestic violence network in Bristol University that's existed long before that, but sexual violence is becoming kind of more recognized in this, in this area. Um, and, but there's still much more research that needs to be done, and often it does feel like we, you know, we try and publish our findings, we share it with our colleagues nationally and internationally, but it's all too common that in our limitations we talk about how this is specific to one site and one region and it'd be really good to, for there to be more research across the country um, but but we have seen we have been able to have a lot of change on a clinical level from doing this research so there's definitely like clinic like immediate advantages as long as well as the broader I, I think it's important for us to you know to understand that we can do something and things have been done. You know, like it's bleak, but it's not as bleak as it was. And I'm not saying that to, to sort of go, so that's okay then, on the contrary. But what I'm really trying to say is that we have to sort of juggle a feeling of anger about what's not done with determination that we have made change happen and we can do more. Because otherwise you just, you know, you'd just give up, wouldn't you? But the, you know, the scale of the problem compared to the scale of the resources and the complete desire I see in governments the world over to sort of go, well, 
do we have to really address this? Can't it just sort of muddle through somehow? I mean, you know, that I think is the, the cruelest thing. And I, and I, I you know, I'm very struck that when I go to A&E, so, you know, I've got two grandchildren. If they bump their head, I can go to A&E and we can whiz through, particularly because they're children. You know, I mean, whizzing might be a few hours, but at least it's, it's there. And so it's understood that if you scald yourself with a hot pan, then you can get attended to and you'll get examined, etc. Why do we not have that same idea of detailed services and places that you are absolutely supposed to be able to go to and access immediately around everything to do with sexual violence and domestic violence? It's a question, yeah. Yeah, what, what do you think about that? Uh, I think it's a long answer. That's um, okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I, I think it's because, for me, it's, it's because men have not been involved in, 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 in listening to us clearly. Uh, because they hold, they have held the power and they hold the purse strings, and usually it's been here is a bit of scraps and off you go. We won't hear from you for a year or two years, and I think um, that is maybe one part of the answer. In that, those like the people in power are the ones who don't feel like it affects them at all, and and so they've just. In my experience, I'm just thinking about not Edinburgh Prices, but my previous work at Shakti Women's Aid, it was very much like that. Take a bit of money, go away, be quiet, be happy. Um, uh -huh. And that's it. And so then, you know, that's one, I feel like that's one thing. I'm sorry, it's not a very well-framed answer. It's a big question. But, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important idea yeah. that somehow the services that we, are, that have, we have normalized in our society haven't been designed by us and they don't really include us. Yeah. And this bit is uh, inconvenient, but can be solved by throwing some money at it and going away and you yes. know, getting on with it. Just a little bit. Just, Just a little enough bit. to keep you quiet. Just enough to make you feel like you have things to get on with. And then six months later, you're back with your begging bowl, which is exactly how most centers run. And, and I feel like we just haven't had that, that, that place at the table to, to make to influence and make those long-term decisions. What's, what's your sense of why it isn't, you know, systemically available? I, I think um, one of the things we do need is more data and evidence because when you do have that, it's harder for people to argue against giving things. And certainly, um, so what we've done at St. Mary's is, um, you know, we, the royal we, Rabia does a lot of it, is getting the evidence, um, publishing it, and then when you present people with it, it is harder for them to turn you away. So, for example, we did um, a big piece of work looking at the non-fatal strangulation. Um, and, you know, using the pap our paper, there was a change in the law very rapidly, not just because of our paper. Other people were, um, were fighting the same battle with us. Um, but that certainly helped. But I think sometimes it's the scale of the problem is just overwhelming for the politicians. Um, so what we notice with the non-fatal strangulation is that one in five people where it's, um, the, the rape is by a partner or ex-partner are saying that they were strangled in the same events. And when we go to um, the commissioners, the politicians, the purse holders and say, what's going on for the victims of domestic violence where they haven't been strangled, what, sorry, where they haven't been sexually assaulted. There is no service for them, but the scale of it, I think, just frightens them away. That's not, so I think we just have to keep gathering the evidence and keep making those arguments um, again and again and again, um, and then I think it will start coming towards us. I mean, that's sort of part of the reason for doing this festival. We're trying to say it, the shame silences people, which means that you're not then able to give the evidence that you exist and this happened. And the more people are able to feel free of the shame or step across that shame boundary to say, and me, and me, and me, the more evidence there is. I mean, do you, you're, you're gathering evidence all the time and data. 
And the idea is that, that once you've got the proof, people then, the money will follow. Are you that optimistic? Um, do, do, do. Yeah. Um, no, so we've had that experience. It is, it, you can make a compelling case when you can make that argument about this is the, you know, this is the percentage of people it's affecting, this is what we're seeing, this is what we need. Um, so, yeah, definitely evidence has helped us. Yeah, I mean, so going back to your point, you're the only um, center that's specifically focused on black women, women of African heritage in the whole country. So for you to gather up the data for the whole country, that seems a gargantuan task. I mean, you know, you've got enough on your plate just running what you're doing. So do we need to link more research institutions to this whole issue? You know, obviously the, 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 the Birkbeck are doing what they're doing. There's a great centre in Glasgow. St Mary's are doing things. But is there a need to get the whole academic and medical um, research teams around the country involved in a way that they're not currently so that you don't have to do all that work? Yeah. Everybody needs to be involved, even though we're <clears throat> um, a specialist African heritage um, charity. But everyone needs to be involved. Um, as you... We, we can't do it by ourselves, but there has to be, um, there has to be some criteria. So one of the things that never used to happen was we were never invited to anything. Even when we were around and we was making a lot of noise, nobody was inviting us anywhere. So little by little they started to invite us and we would be saying straight in their face, why weren't we invited to this, that, the other and everything? Why were you talking for us? There's a lot of things that you do not know. There's a lot of research being done. There's a lot of talking, but there's not enough action on this front. So go to the people who know best. Um, that was one of the things. And a lot of them don't like to hear them things. We would also be saying, well, it's a lot of white middle-class men talking about us, making decisions for us, and that we're not, we're not happy about that. So it's about having your voice, it's about saying what you have to say, and it's about talking your truth. The whole thing about culture is very, very important. That has to come in it, but a lot of times people don't want you to be talking about race and culture and gender and you know what you, they don't like you to be talking about what they don't know mm, mm -hmm. because they think they're the authority on everything. Um, our experience, black women's experience, as you were talking about the intersectionality, took me a long time to be saying that word all the time, intersectionality, but um, that is just so important. So if somebody comes to, to, to your organization uh, for the rape and the forensic, etc., before we can even get to where we need to get to, if it's the domestic abuse, the violence, the rape, before we can even do that, we've got so much to unpackage. We've got to unpackage the history that we have in this, in this country. We're talking about the history, for example, with the police. That is, that is a long thing. Most of you may have um, an awareness about that. We have to unpackage the history. When there's a rape, when the police come, our, um, the stereotypes about black women, the myths about black women. We have to, you mentioned about um, getting the, is it not having the money, you've got money thrown at you. We've never had money thrown at us. Grassroots organization, nobody throws money at you until or unless you're in with a big organization, mm -hmm. which we happen to be because we're with um, victim support and the mayor's office now, but that was a hard slog. Um, so a lot of it is about um, organizations coming together, the government and everybody else listening. So when we're saying to you about your, pol your policies and your procedures and, um, and the, the, the basic awareness of tackling subjects which you're very uncomfortable with, because once you are able to do that, once you're able to get past that, then we can talk, then things can happen. Then the women, the, the clients and the service users can trust you or even listen 
to what you have to say. At the moment, they're not listening because they're over there at the back of the room, maybe watching a screen, but until and unless you all come forward and we work together to make things happen, but be honest about all the other issues, the other underlying issues that keeps women away and they, they don't get the service that they um, deserve, until and, un, until and unless those things are addressed, you're still going to be at, at, at the same level mm -hmm. um, that, we are, that we are at now. So I want to take a couple of questions from the floor before we finish. If there are questions, and if there's a microphone here, anybody would like to ask a question of the, the group here? Mm. Yes, there's somebody right at the back and there's somebody at the right at the front. Hi, um, I just wonder if you could talk a bit about where you th think this might sit as a kind of issue of multiple deprivation, actually. I mean, I think um, a lot of women that I work with are kind of living in poverty, uh, spending a lot of time fighting other systems, like getting their children education health plans, and it's almost like this is a background issue. Um, you know, they've got, they're, they're struggling with their own mental health, so they're struggling with mental health services, and kind of historic, maybe even not that historic, sexual and domestic violence is almost like the last thing on the list for them. Yeah, that's a really good point. Can I take this other question down here, and we'll, I would, we'll take two, that somebody here, put your hand up there, here, here, there, put your hand up further if you wouldn't mind, just so the microphone can come to you. Um, my question is from Rizal. Um, with the difference in how culture affects women who have accessed your services, you talked about black or Asian or trans people. Is there a difference in how you provide that service within, within your uh, organization? I'd love that because I know culture affects hugely how we feel about sexual violence, how we respond to it. Okay, so there's two really complex and important questions. One is, you know, in the services, how do the services create real nuance and recognition of different cultural needs and experiences? And the other is the, with women who have multiple needs, uh, including just, you know, literal survival for them and their kids, the, the sexual violence is almost like a given and like doesn't, necessarily comes to the front of their needs. Um, can we start with that first question about, you know, the, this multiple need, multiple deprivation, and therefore, like, just almost not privileging this idea of domestic violence or sexual violence? Yes. Um, so in my current work, I would say that we are not very good at uh, responding to multiple deprivations and because of how we have responded to our funding crisis uh, and how our services are, are designed, particularly rape crisis services. Uh, and that's something that I'm trying to change to get my colleagues to think more about what else is going on in, in a survivor's life who's, who's been referred to our center. She may have been referred because it's easy to find us because she's made a disclosure of sexual violence, but she's coming with so many other challenges that she has to deal with and she can't actually sit down with you and talk to you about the impact of sexual violence on her. Uh, you need to go and sort out the other issues or link her in with other issues before um, we can even get to healing from, from the trauma. Um, and that, you know, dealing with all of that is also part of that, that process. And the way our model is, is very much it's a, a talking shop. And if if how we are designed or have been designed historically has been, I see you for X number of sessions or in the past for X number of years when there were fewer women using rape crisis services because it was so hard to, to do that. Um, by the time you're done with the number of sessions you've allocated, you haven't even scratched the surface. So it's a real challenge. And this is why I think, you know, as, as Rose was saying, we need to connect more with other organizations, particularly those who haven't seen their work, whether it is in 
dealing with responding to poverty or, or homelessness. Yeah. They haven't really taken that gendered lens or looked at the impact of, of sexual violence. And also, just to respond to politicians, you know, um, I love money. I love talking about money. I always have figures in my head because I know that that is what I need so that I can transform the way my, my organization works um, and in fact take us back to how we were in our early years. Um, I think the evidence that is missing and the evidence that we don't talk about enough is the cost to our economy, to our state, uh, when women are not able to participate in, in life and I think I just yeah. pause there. Yeah, for I mean that that's, a, that's a huge thing, isn't it? That everything untreated is a cost to society yeah. because of the impact of that lack of treatment and, and multiple understandings of needs. Again, in terms of the language, I mean, of of help. Without, it, but do you think by targeting, you know, sexual violence, domestic violence, and not looking at the holistic, sort of like the violence of power on people? In, all, in multiple ways. Do you think that's also separating us out from dealing with the problems? I, I would uh, absolutely agree with that. I don't know why there is this separation now of uh, sexual violence against domestic violence because um, there's such a massive overlap. There's a massive overlap with the uh, child abuse as well. Um, so I would think that there needs to be coming together. And there's international models, aren't there, where, you know, um, family justice centers, um, where you're looking more holistically at the, the person, the family, the community within which they exist. Um, certainly some of the work we've done looking at mental health. Um, so adults uh, coming for an acute forensic medical examination, so they're saying it's just happened. Um, it was 69% or thereabouts had a pre-existing mental health problem. So it's, it's huge. And then you throw in what Rabia mentioned before about the learning disability. Um, we've got a very vulnerable cohort who are being targeted, yeah. um, aren't they? Absolutely. I mean, we, we heard this morning about, you know, the percentage of disabled women who are harmed and very often learning disability doesn't get kind of included in that story and I know how prevalent it is and how normalized again it is but you know the the question of um, cultural specificity as well and the fact that you know by, by not recognizing it, recognizing it you end up with white women who can and, and act, act access a service, doing that, and then re-emphasizing the idea that it's for them. What can be done about that? That's, um, so, I think it's, it's yeah, so it's white, able-bodied women. Um, I think, like we discussed before, and people with learning disabilities, people with physical disabilities, even if they are of the indigenous white population, are also struggling to access services. But if we're thinking about, and also actually what the first person mentioned in the comment, I think that was really important, thinking about um, deprivation. So I think there's a lot of work that's being done around underserved communities, or maybe not work, but there's definitely more recognition. But as well as that, there are, um, so people that are, again, white, but they might be more socially deprived, they might, we also see that they're disproportionately affected by you know, um, sexual violence. And we could probably do more about making the services more accessible to them, particularly where we, we see, we've done research looking at police referrals versus self-referrals. And our self-referral group are quite a different group in terms of, even though the, both groups are majority white, if you look at deprivation, there's a real difference. Um, so we, in terms of what, even, even the uh, pathway that you use to access a service, it can really vary depending on what your background is. In terms of making services more accept, accessible to people of different cultures, um, you know, there's, there's the kind of things that we, we are doing. So having like translator services, um, so having interpreters, having leaflets in different languages, having leaflets that are more easy to read. So again, at St. Mary's, we've developed, a while ago we got some funding from NHS England, and this is actually accessible and 
um, it's a resource that's freely available. So these are easy read leaflets that are meant to be accessible for people with learning disabilities, but actually they're really useful for people that might have English as a second language or um, people that are just arriving at the service where they're not operating at optimal cognitive capacity at three or four in the morning. Um, so there's lots, of, there's lots of things that we can actually do that are supportive of people that are from maybe from a minority ethnic group, but actually then by doing that, we're supporting lots of other um, people as well. So I think, I hope that answers the question a little bit. I think there's a lot more that, we can, that can be done. It's a bit like what Rose said before as well about having representation. So having, I think that's really key. Um, so it's, you know, it's about having a seat at the table, having people with different backgrounds that are involved in making decisions around policy and decisions around how services operate and how services are funded. Um, and yeah, my favorite is having the evidence that considers these minority groups and looking at you know, what, might, um, what might make a service more accessible, asking those people themselves. I think that's quite key. Yeah, I mean, Caroline Credo Perez's book, which some of you may have read, uh, read, Invisible Women, demonstrates to us that the statistics around research and women are absolutely appalling to the extent that you know, you're more likely to die of a heart attack as a woman because the equipment hasn't taken into account what women's hearts are like. You're more likely to, you're five times more likely to die in childbirth if you're a black woman because they haven't taken into account the research needed about difference. You know, over and over again, research has been skewed to go, it's a white man. Now, we, we kind of know that now and we've got to use our energy to influence the academic community and the research community, as well as you know, the frontline grassroots politics side of things, because both are needed, because it's not like we haven't been saying for years this is needed, but as you say, finally you go and here's the data. That becomes harder to wriggle out of. So you know, going back uh, uh, as, we, as we conclude this session, do, you've talked about having to be a, you know, a, a, a bloody difficult person a lot of the time, just to get to shout and get heard in Hackney and beyond. Um, because of what's happened recently, because of Me Too, because of Black Lives, and because of, as you say, a kind of recognition that unless we're all free, none of us are free, that intersectionality responsibility that we all have, do you think that the conversations are getting richer and more intelligent between more people than they were when you first tried to, try, tried to start educating everybody? The conversation is getting better with people like you all that are sitting here, people like us that are sitting on the panel. But up there, no. Yeah. Um, we're going to meetings where people are asking questions like, what services do you need? What kind of things do you think we should be doing? We was at one, was it a, a week and a half ago? And they're asking all these questions. And you're sitting there thinking, what? We all know what we need. We know what needs to be done. It was another talking shop. You're just still talking and talking and talking. Action is what we need. Little things like seeing yourself reflected in services. So if, if, um, if you're looking for a, a, a rape a service, for example, if I go on your website, I expect to see somebody that, that looks like me on your website. And vice, you know, and so on and so forth. And oftentimes, you just you don't you don't see that. Um, the book you mentioned about uh, the invisible woman um, thing—that's what we, as African people, we as black people, that's how we feel. But yet, we've been in this country for so long. We are part of uh, the community and everything. But again, we just still feel very, very much invisible. And also, we have um, we have a solution. We we try to constantly bring solutions and one of the solutions that we have is Valerie's Law. It took us six months to get a hundred thousand signatures for a petition to make um, training compulsory for uh, professionals who deal with black women going through domestic abuse. Six months and we got that hundred thousand signature on the day but it took that we had to get celebrities and you know a lot of people um, to help to, to you know to raise it. The support that we've got has been phenomenal. 
yeah? Grassroots people, everybody, they, you know, they push it. They help to uh, bring forward and to show people, you know what? In this time, 2021, we're still kind mm -hmm. of like really way back. There is, there is still a, lot of, uh, a long way to go. But in saying that, things are happening and things are moving. And if we can still um, just have our voice, say what you have to say, um, and, and, you know, and put forward uh, uh, strategies, then, then that will work. And so for us, the next thing, we, we, we got the 100,000 uh, a few weeks ago, and now it's now trying to get the MPs now to support us. Most of the MPs have never heard of or been to or have any interest in um, grassroots organizations, the things that they want to do, the way that they want to do it, etc. But, we, you know, just keep talking. We just keep yeah. talking. We just keep pushing it through. And um, it's a learning for us also. It's not that we're always dissing these people and moaning about them, but we're learning from it also. And um, so now we're at this stage now where we're going to try and get the MPs on board to really look at this law that we would like implemented so that we don't lose any more lives for black women, but also it will help everybody, um, you know, nationally and, and internationally. Okay, we're, we're gonna end there. Um, you've been a fantastic panel, thank you. And, and also, you know, it's hard slog, it's really hard slog doing your jobs. So I just want to say I, we're, gl we're grateful because it's very, very poorly paid it's very, very indiscriminating in terms of work-life balance. I mean, it's like no life and all work. And, you know, it shouldn't be that way. Women shouldn't be having to carry the burden all the time of this stuff. But by us all turning up today and thinking, okay, what can we all do collectively? We still can make a difference. We still can go forward. So thank you very much for this morning. Thank you, panel.